Welcome everyone back from um, what was a, a very tasty lunch, and uh, we're going to uh, we're going to start in on the second part of our program. Uh, for those who are, are just joining us here, this is the um, fourth of the uh, Provost forums on the public university and the social good. Um, our sessions today are really focused on the ideas of engaged scholarship and the ways that universities can both link. Uh, in more uh, more productive ways with the, the broader communities and how we can also engage in a in a more um, mutual learning uh, mode so this morning we heard uh, some inspiring uh, uh, insights about how uh, models of this uh, how this can work um, this afternoon um, starting now we'll be thinking about how this can be institutionalized within the, uh, within the academy, uh, and we have as our uh, leadoff speaker here, Ken Reardon. Uh, Ken is a, a professor and director of the graduate program in city and regional planning at the University of Memphis. Uh, he's a nationally renowned expert in community organizing, community-based neighborhood planning, and university community partnerships. He received the American Institute of Certified Planners President's Award for his role in establishing and directing the highly regarded East St. Louis Action Research Project um, while a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, and more recently has been involved in recovery planning uh, for New Orleans Ninth Ward in collaboration with groups of planning students. Um, we're really pleased that, that Ken is here. Uh, he's been an uh, inspiration uh, for me, although we've just met now directly uh, as someone coming out of the planning field. Um, and we'll both have a, his keynote and then he'll be uh, leading a more interactive session on um, uh, really how, how, this, how this plays out in practice. So um, thank you for joining us, Jen and uh, Ken, and let's um, uh, warmly welcome. So I'm going to tell you the secret of how to become a renowned, engaged scholar. Um, I uh, was finishing up my PhD at an upstate institution that will remain named. We refer to it affectionately as Uncle Ezra's Day Camp, high above Cayuga's waters, uh, not far from where Nancy is the president and doing a remarkable job not only on the campus but in the city. And it's sort of set a very high watermark for what urban universities can do to help turn around a, a city a lot of work in upstate, which has been losing economic activity since the Civil War. So there's a, a, big, a big trend to uh, counter. Uh, but uh, I was uh, finishing up my PhD at Cornell. I was hired to teach in an interdisciplinary experiential education program. It was in the College of Human Ecology. It was set up by the great Yuri Bronfenbrenner as a way to create opportunities for undergraduates mostly to be engaged in interdisciplinary research projects with community-based organizations on what Yuri described as the unfinished work of American democracy, trying to transcend uh, issues of race, class, gender, to really bring, finally, some reality of the promise of uh, the American dream of the founding fathers and mothers to uh, upstate and, and New York. We had some budgetary problems, which occasionally happens in New York, where it's a, it's a parlor game as to how late in the year you can not pass your budget. Uh, which I think we've trained the Washington, D.C. in. So uh, the third Cuomo administration, Cuomo administration one, uh, Cornell had to make some budget cuts, and we had this award-winning uh, engaged scholarship program right at the point where nationally this was becoming the rage. And because we had chosen not to uh, take tenured positions, we're talking about how do you both meet the needs to be responsible allies to community-based organizations and meet the ever-ascending requirements of tenure at a Research One university. We had read an article by a very influential dean of the Vanderbilt Medical School, Dick Coteau, a graduate of the 1960s Freedom Summer. And Dick had written an, art an article called The Benefits of Marginality. He said, at, within cell life, the interesting things happen at the edge of the cells. I, I have to take Dick's word, because I went to Catholic school where we didn't discuss the technical <laughs> aspects. We just said God made it, and it was good. Uh, and he said, in organizational life, if you're too close to the major masthead in the institution, if your office is too close to an uninspired provost, that wouldn't be the case here at Davis, you could be in trouble. It's best to be a little bit away from the centers of power. 
So we chose to have non-tenure track positions. They have budget cuts. The tenure track faculty get in a room and they say, okay, we got to cut 8%. What do we do? Eliminate Yuri Bronfenbrenner's dream program. And we all get fired. So uh, I go on the job market. I go and give a talk on my dissertation, the economic development reform efforts of Harold Washington, first black mayor of Chicago. The, pre the head of the planning program at University of Illinois came up to me and said, come and interview. I get on the phone immediately because I just lost my, my job. And I uh, call my wife and I said, what do you think about Chicago? And she's in shock. She says, the University of Chicago is going to hire someone like you? And I said, no. She said, Northwestern? Loyola, we're going down the food chain. I said, no, the University of Illinois. And she laughed. She says, do you know where Urbana is? I said, well, you know, Oak Park, it's probably right next to that. We can hop on a commuter trail. Anyway, her response was, buy a Hammond map and call me in the morning. So I get the map, and being the uh, uh, consummate planner that I am, I don't want to actually use the uh, legend to locate where Urbana is. I want to intuitively figure out Urbana, where would it be within Chicagoland? An hour and a half later, I realized it's 200 miles centrally isolated, and as Nancy knows, uh, from any place you'd probably ever really want to tell anybody you actually live, and I'm the newest faculty member in planning. I walk in, it's September, I meet the nice man who was uh, uh, dim-witted enough to hire me, even though I didn't know where his university was located. Wonderful guy, Lou Hopkins. And he says, hi. He says, you're now the director of the East St. Louis Action Research Project. And I'm looking around. I'm from New York, as you probably could tell. And I uh, said, I didn't see any signs for St. Louis or East St. Louis coming in from the airport. Just where the hell is East St. Louis? 188 miles as the crow flies from the central campus. So already, how is it that universities have a hard time finding a struggling neighborhood outside their front gate? Did we end up? 188 miles down the road. Well, it's very interesting. The state senator from East St. Louis, Wyvetter Young, who just passed away, an amazing woman, who's the longest sitting African American woman in any Midwestern legislature when she passed, uh, just a beacon of uh, good sense, courage, and uh, uh, great intellectual ability. And uh, she had finally become, after years, the chairperson of a committee known as the Higher Ed Finance Committee of the state legislature, which is where the university gets their money. <laughs> and so Stanley Eikenberry III was, was it the third? It was almost a Hollywood name. He was actually our system president, is, uh, goes down for the annual state of the campus speech. And actually, the House and the Senate come together. They hear the governor one week. And the next week, the head of the land-grant university system comes. It's that important in a place like Illinois, where those values of the moral act of using knowledge to do good really matter. And right as Stanley was about ready to get up and take his mark, Wyvetta grabbed him and said, I'm the new chair of the Higher Ed Finance Committee, and I just want you to know, while smiling to him, that there's no chance in hell you're going to get any of your budget out of my committee until you make a commitment to East St. Louis, Illinois, where is my district to demonstrate what you're going to do for, as an urban public service university, for a struggling African American community. And in a record time in higher ed, you know, the president calls the provost in, the poor provost has to drag three deans in, and the provost gets his pocket picked for 250000 by the president. He then tells these three deans, you will go in the fall and do good things in East St. Louis. In the fall, the newest professor shows up, brand, le brand new, minted from uh, Cornell. And of course, I you know, thought I was quite smart, at least uh, I thought. I walk in, and I'm now the director of this program. I know almost nothing, really. And uh, so I make my first trip to East St. Louis. And it turned out that this program had been going on for 10 years. And so I went and interviewed all the normal cast of characters, if you were running a real community development assistance program, who should know about it. The city manager, he said, what program? Uh, the head of the school board, you're here? Where? Are you running like the stealth bomber assistance program? <laughs> Nobody knew who the hell we were. So then, being the smart, uh, recently minted social scientist that I imagined that I was, I changed my question. Instead of saying, what do you think of the program, I changed it to, what do you think of the idea of a community a development assistance program, long-term partnership between the University of Illinois, the great land-grant university, the fighting Illini, 
end East St. Louis. And my favorite quote was from a, a renowned local leader. She said, honey, the last thing we need is a goddamn guy who looks just like you <laughs> using $250,000 of state money that we could really use for a whole lot of important things telling us what any sixth grader in town already has figured out. That was my introduction. So I was smart enough to decide to go back for a second tutorial with this person. Her name was Ciola Davis, a longtime outreach worker at uh, Leslie Bates Davis Community Center. And at that point, Ms. Davis realized that I, I was a work in progress and I needed more uh, ed education, a little bit more you know, knowledge up. So when I came to the second meeting, she had on her desk three milk cartons. One said 1960, it had 11 reports, $7.9 million. The next one, 1970s, 25 reports, $18 million. 1980s, 42 reports, $22 million, et cetera. She says, these are the number of reports done by public universities, most of them yours, studying how rotten things are in River City. And half of this number on the side went for your university overhead so that the university could find its way to our community and deal with the extra expense. Yet in order for you to be successful in any of these, you need longtime community partners who can help you understand the history, the practices that have been attempted, what the current uh, issues are. And there's no extra assistance for us. There's just a lot of extra work. And so the bad news is that you've created and practiced a form of highly repressive social science research that's mostly generated knowledge that's further demonized our community by showing how rotten things are and she says, not one of the projects identified in here in the very thin recommendations about what to do. We're big on description, very little on prescription. We like to describe the world as it is, but we're not as agitated as Marx said we should to be talking about the way the world should be. She says, not one of those recommendations ever got implemented. So she says, that's the bad news. I'm saying, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So, but there's good news. She says, resurrection is always available within the African-American community <laughs> for people who have some humility and basic intelligence. And she said, we'd like to suggest there is still a way to pursue an honorable partnership between our community and the land-grant university known as the University of Illinois. We can actually establish a non-colonial, reciprocal, mutually beneficial partnership by adopting some very basic principles. And you should take some notes. And she asked me to write these things down for my boss. And so the first thing she said was, number one, since we live, work, worship, recreate, create the music, the culture, and knowledge that has kept this place together in rich and thin times, we should be the folks who determine what the research questions are. It should be a research agenda that is driven by the hopes and aspirations of the community, not of the needs of an assistant professor, as smart as he might be from Cornell University, to move up the ranks and get tenure at the home of the fighting Illini. Secondly, she said, and I love this language, we're not interested in a one-night stand with the University of Illinois. Uh, drive by social science. Stay long enough just to figure out how bad things really are without noticing the incredible things that are still going on that are functioning when all public and private institutions are withdrawn in a place where the local economy has failed. Um, and she says, so we need a minimum commitment of five years. And I'm like, oh my god. I mean, in a typical academic unit, community people, we try to keep this like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Most department chairs can't even figure out what their faculty's going to teach the next year, let alone five years from now. So a five-year commitment is almost beyond the ability of most faculty to imagine. So five years, and then I loved it. She said, uh, beyond your probationary year. So she was asking for a six-year commitment, and she was only going to commit one year to see how bad and how needy and how incompetent and how much trouble I was going to be working with my students. And I knew a little bit about probation because in high school, I went to a Catholic school, and we tried to 
reposition the Blessed Virgin in a more welcoming way at the entrance to our school. It didn't turn out very well. The Blessed Virgin fell on the ground. She lost her head in the process. And we all got probation, which is why I ended up at UMass and not Notre Dame. Uh, the third point, she said, we decide on the agenda. It's got to be five years. The third thing, she said, is we want to be equal partners at each and every step of the research process. So basically, she was describing a commitment to participatory <coughs> action research, where local knowledge, as Gertz talks about, with the expert knowledge that White and others have talked about, collide. And you intentionally create as diverse a set of participants as possible to challenge taken for granted assumptions that often prevent you from getting a clear fix on the trajectory and the evolution of the problem, what the opportunities for resolution might be. So she says, we want a participatory approach to doing the research so that when you leave, and you will, when she said, the shine goes off the apple in higher ed, when the scholarship of engagement is no longer on the top of the American Association of College and Universities annual conferences, we are still going to be here dealing with the effects of a 70 or 80 year process of deindustrialization, suburbanization, and dis disinvestment. And so uh, we therefore uh, want to make sure that there's ongoing capacity. So she said, we want you to set up an independent nonprofit organization that will actually be the policy guide for directing our ongoing partnership. And we want to have 55% of the seats on that group. So that was fantastic. Then my favorite one, getting down the list, we weren't finished yet. She said, is we want something called uh, uh, parity. She says, every dollar you feel you have to go and get to support the project in East St. Louis, we want 50 cents of it. Because you have special needs to come and bring the quad to the commons, the commons have special needs to accommodate the extra expense and difficulties and challenges of having a bunch of largely culturally uninformed uh, and ethnographically challenged uh, white folks from the suburbs coming down to help. You know, it's going to be a year before they can just keep from getting into a lot of trouble, before they can actually contribute. So I wrote these things down, and she, I was about ready to say, we'll do all of these things. She said, uh, but don't tell me of what your response to these requirements are. Just go back and talk to your dean about it. And I brought it back to uh, Dean Conlin, wonderful dean that I'm sure Nancy knows. And she uh, had theater background. She looked at it. She says, well, obviously, these people have worked with higher ed before. <laughs> and she said, she wrote on the piece of paper, which I, she asked me to bring down. She says, we will do everything we can to honor the spirit and the letter of this agreement. And that became the foundation of what I think was a really remarkable, more than 20-year <laughs> partnership between the University of Illinois and the East St. Louis community. And our partner there was a group called the Emerson Park Development Corporation. It was years before I found out where these women came from. And it was all women driven. A woman by Ciela Davis was the lead organizer. When they were young girls in the 1960s, the NAACP came by in their youth development program and invited these women who were all living in Gompers Public Housing. That was the first public housing project in the state of Illinois. They had young children and asked if they would come to the South to help organize in Ruleville, Mississippi, in the great organizing effort of Robert Moses, the good Robert Moses, not the planner, uh, but the civil rights leader and the head of the Algebra Project, and Fannie Lou Hamer, whose name was in tone this morning, who became my major uh, inspiration for doing the work that I've done the last 35 years. These women went down and were so transformed by the courage, the ingenuity, the guts of these women who were going around and organizing the local community to provide the spaces for the civil rights workers, that on the way back to St. Louis on the Greyhound bus, these eight women in 1964 made a commitment to creating a citizens movement to turn their city around. I was showing up in 1990, and they had been at it for more than uh, 25 years. And the way they got started when they got back, they looked around the community, and they said, you know, you got to focus on the thing that may be not the most important, but it's the, it's the, it's the, maybe the most visible and perhaps has some symbolic value. So there was, in front of the community center, three burned out buildings. And these women, eight women, they recruited their neighbors to take down these three buildings, three three-story buildings, brick by brick, stick by stick, pulled out all the piping, all the lead, all the copper wiring, 
put it all for recycling, got a local contractor to take it over to the Creek and Quiche Gentrification District of uh, Cherokee Street in St. Louis where people like to have bricks with right, proper patina. And they got $15,000 for dissembling these buildings. And then for one year they ran a campaign called Don't Cook Tonight, Call Ciola. And on Friday nights you'd get a $5 chicken or a fish dinner. And they made 15000 grow to 20000 because they wanted to do something spectacular for their first project. A drop-dead beautiful children's toddler's park in a space that was uh, uh, most evident in terms of what deindustrialization looks like in its most uh, brutal form in their community. And so for a year, that's what they did. And then they looked across the river through the arch, and right framing the arch is the famous Dred Scott Courthouse, right? Uh, makes an important symbolic point, sort of looming over their horizon. And they saw a company that many of them supported one way or another. It was called Ralston Purina. And they went over to the nice people at Ralston, told them how many pets they had. They showed pictures of all the uh, unsupervised animals in East St. Louis, which at that point was a large number. And they shamed these guys into matching their grassroots fundraising effort, and they built Suge Park. That was the first project. That gave a sense to people that even in the most difficult circumstances, by establishing strategic partnerships, they could make something happen. We got the park built. The next project was to try to remove illegal dumping in the neighborhood. And that was our first project, my first studio class, was to do a GIS analysis of illegal dumping. 1,407 sites in the city of East St. Louis, which was so broke in the mid-1980s, the city had eliminated most of its operating agencies. They were no longer paying their light bill. There was no street lights, no traffic lights. Between 1986 and 1992, there was no garbage collection. And uh, unscrupulous trash holders from mostly Missouri, suburbanites, getting a deep discount on their trash collection would get 30 40% off because the trash hauler would then come at night onto streets that no longer had street lighting, and they would just dump 18 wheelers full of trash. And that's where all these sites came from. So my students started this project, and you know, the residents were very smart, right? They didn't want to invest too much in my, myself. I, you know, that was a smart move on their part, and my students. So they gave us something that we probably couldn't make any worse. You know, the sighting of the, of the trash. So we started doing this, the GIS work, and the students started doing calculations. You know, 100 tons of this, 26,000 uh, truck tires, 110,000 uh, residential automobile tires. And I gave the question, how many years would it take the population of East St. Louis, 40,000 people, 80% of which are in households with no private automobiles, to generate 100,000? It came up to almost infinity. And so they realized it wasn't coming from the community. We realized we were being victims of environmental racism and injustice. And so the students said, well, can we start opening the garbage bags? And we'll start mapping, based upon the mail, what the uh, mailing districts are, where the garbage is coming from. And so the students, we had one map. Garbage by type, we had an elegant topography. I never realized that garbage could come in so many different ways, in terms of what it was and how you could dispose of it, and what rules and regulations would be governed on it. And then the second thing was where it came from. And it came from 13 suburban, exurban, St. Louis County, Missouri towns where just three trash haulers, all of whose names ended in a vowel, were providing deeply discounted trash and getting that uh, discount by not paying tipping fees at a legal dump site. And so with that information, we were able to take it to the US Attorney's Office for the Southern District and with a very cooperative federal judge, he invited uh, these gentlemen in and helped them see that if they made a $3 million donation, I think he called it a fine, they could maybe not go to jail this year. Uh, and that's how we got started. So a small park, the trash identification, the identification of resources, and then we worked with a whole set of public and private agencies to come up with a system to remove that trash using that first $3 million to leverage other public funds. We got all the garbage out. We were invited down for what I thought was a party. I'm Irish. We celebrate everything. You know, It's Thursday. We should have a party. Tomorrow, there will be another excuse. So I came down with my colleagues who had worked on the mapping project. And as we pulled up to the site, which was at the intersection of the worst uh, trash accumulation, all these elders parked their cars around us. I thought this was odd, right? 
And what they were doing is they were basically, uh, it's the first case of uh, professor hijack. They wouldn't let us leave until we made a commitment to transform the center of this illegal dumping into uh, a site that could be of great uh, pride for the community. So we then built the first neighborhood scale playground. And we had our students in landscape architecture go back and we started doing some sketches looking at the best urban parks around the country, a lot of them here in California. And uh, we went back to the community and a, a bunch of the elders who had initiated this process started scratching their heads and said, gee, uh, what do we know about play? We're like 100 years old. We haven't really had a good time since D-Day, you know, <laughs> uh, or VJ Day. And uh, they said, let's get the kids involved. So that's really when we began to then expand in terms of participatory action research, not just adults, but young people in the community. So we went to the uh, Miles Davis School. Miles Davis grew up in this neighborhood. His father was a dentist. He apparently was an incredible pain in the ass, as you could imagine, as a young kid. He was totally uh, difficult. He never went to school. His father was pulling his hair out. And because the African American community was so pressed economically, he would often do barter. He'd do somebody's teeth, and they would do something for him. So a music teacher uh, came in to get some work done, and apparently Miles was at his height of irascibility, which you can only imagine, because he had many heights of irascibility. And uh, they made a deal. If you teach my son the piano, he had no interest in the piano, and the trumpet came out, and the rest is history. So in that school, we went to the Miles Davis School, brought out some uh, pizza, gave the kids uh, 60 foot of butcher block paper, and said, draw your ideal of a drop dead beautiful playground. And it was fantastic. The room filled up with laughter, and kids started drawing these incredible structures that we, we could neither build or insure or pay for. But they did that. Then we hung this mural that the kids made up in the uh, hallway. And for the next week, we gave kids uh, smiling faces. Put the smiling face on the element you most want, and then a skull and crossbone on the thing you, you least want. And then we came back a couple weeks later, and we had a, light, a scale cutout on the floor, green felt. And we gave the kids life-size cutouts of all the improvements. And the kids would take the uh, swing set and put it where it would belong, uh, as they view, in their new park. And then they would take the flower beds, raised beds for the elders and folks with physical limitations. Where would that be? Everything's going great. But I keep noticing that there's this young girl named Maria. And she keeps putting the seating area for the elderly at the bottom of the sliding pot. You know? <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know, you know, we would say my undergraduate degree in social work that she had some issues, little elder, elder side issues. So I, you know, she put the grandparents under the bottom of the slide. I would remove them. She was put back. I would remove them. And then finally, this girl, a room of 60 people, a couple of ministers, the school principal, and she screams at me, "You don't understand anything. My grandparents will never let me come to this park if they're not right in the middle." They won't view it as being safe. Don't you understand anything? And I thought, wow, I'm like, you know, totally leveled by this brilliant and courageous 11-year-old, right? He's going to tell this 40-year-old white guy from the university with a PhD behind his name that he has his, uh, his bearings incorrect. Right? <laughs> <laughs> then she went on all the other stupid things about the design. And they were brilliant. So we had this big storage area that we were going to reinforce with concrete and steel bars. She says, that looks like Fort Knox. What are people going to think is in there? Gold. And every week they're going to tear that up. What? To save you $3 in crappy basketballs? And she just went down the list. And by the time they got done deconstructing our park, it was completely reimagined the way that it would work in their environment. And we realized that they understood at the micro level things about that space and place and the community, its history and its culture that we did. And it was really fabulous. They did a design, and then we had little or no money in Illinois. Uh, we were, things weren't going too well. Why do me? Yeah, no, listen. Nancy was an incredible breath of fresh air. And uh, so uh, we then took this design, and we had the kids go before the two largest black churches and present it. And the one minister has become a very good friend, uh, Herman Watson. You might have known him uh, as an international boxing star, but he had one little minor moment of uh, inattention. So uh, the kids are up, and they are really excited describing what this playground could look like. And Reverend Watson leaned over to me and said, you're going to hell. I said, my mother has already told me that, but could you give me the theological reason for why? He says, you're turning the entire uh, 
uh, church, you're putting us in a position where we're going to have to build this damn thing. You're organizing the village to pressure the elders to create this thing. And, you know, I said, well, if you have to go to hell for one reason, that's not a bad one. And so his church mobilized. He got the other black ministers to mobilize. And it was really remarkable. We started getting phone calls. People were so excited about this happening. A guy calls me up. He moved out of the neighborhood 40 years ago. He has a concrete company. He calls me up and says, do you need mud? I'm thinking, mud? You know, I've never done construction. So, you know, yes, you do need mud. We're doing sidewalks and et cetera. And this guy shows up two days before we're supposed to do it, puts all the forms in with his sons, and does uh, all the hearts work for us. And uh, the morning we went down to build uh, was at 5 o'clock. We came down to set up our volunteer areas. We had adults from the community. Black church women were going to feed us. We had an area for that. We had some tents to do first aid because we weren't very competent building things. And uh, 5 o'clock in the morning I show up. There are already 12 young children and their aunts and grandparents on the site. And I was like blown away. So I get out and say hello and I said, and what are you kids doing so early? I'm thinking that maybe you know they're going to go to an early church service or something. They're going to go over to the farmer's market in St. Louis. They said, well, we, we designed it. Of course, we're going to build it, right? And their mothers told me that they hadn't been able to sleep for two days. The excitement of imagining something and working through the process, making the presentation of the church to create something of beauty in a place that so desperately needed it. And so it was harrowing. We had adults little kids, we have great pictures with kids waving to the videographer, and their hands are so small they look like, you know, the Disney characters with over, oversized hands. So we built the uh, playground. That got an enormous burst of energy from a wider range of neighborhoods. As a result of that, we started organizing what became known as volunteer work weekends, where residents would identify homes owned by elders or low-income families or people with physical disabilities that were threatening to go from being perhaps needing and repair to dilapidation. And we started raising money on the campus and in the community to, uh, looks like it's on, uh, in the community to then do what we called, uh, you know, minor home repairs. And it got to the point where the class that did the first garbage study had 11 students in it. By the third or fourth year, we were bringing between 50 and 100 students to East St. Louis every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday for 20 years to do projects identified by the community in which they mobilized local folks. We would never do a project unless there was a local community manager, support team, and they had participated in the planning. We would then bring the resources from the university. And in the typical weekend, students would be involved in facilitating a neighborhood meeting on Tuesday, maybe helping do sign-in, taking notes, doing some sketches. The next day, they might do a survey of a new area in terms of what they might need in terms of senior housing. And then they would spend two days doing construction. One of the brilliant ideas I came up with uh, is that uh, we always came back on Saturday night because, you know, you know, you have to have one day of rest. And, uh, but, you know, in the neighborhood, the real activity is Sunday morning in churches. So I decided one weekend with a particularly malleable group of very enthusiastic uh, graduate students who I thought I could convince to do this. I said, we're staying until Sunday afternoon, and Sunday morning we're all going to church. And it's like in absolute unison. This is a public university. My mother can't make me go to church. I'll be a guy damn that's not professor in city planning is going to make me go to church. And I said, listen, we are not bringing you to a Baptist church to make a good Baptist out of you. Let's face it, John, you don't have the stuff to be So you know, that's, you know, there's a limitation to the resurrection potentials of a secular <laughs> professor. But this is where people get together. This is what's held their community together. This is what gives them the strength to deal with incredible structural forces of, of destruction. And we have to understand that. And it was easy to make that speech. And of course, they sort of, you know, they liked me, at least at that moment, I had given any really bad grades. So they went along. So the next day, we're dropping them off in groups of three and four. I have no intention of going to church. I am going to go to Our Lady of Dunkin' Donuts, read the New York Times. Three or four hours later, I will go and pick up these poor folks and hope they're still standing. Well, we're dropping everybody off. The last four kids in the car are two Japanese students and uh, two young guys from Alabama A&M who just their first week in the graduate program. And uh, I go to drop them off, and this young kid, his name's Howard Johnson from Alabama, says, well, you're coming with us, right? 
And because these, these Japanese kids, I bet you they're not quite ready for what they're going to experience in this church. It was a full-blown, full-gospel, evangelical, the nurse corps with the fans. And, you know, when these young girls went to temple, contemplative, quiet, meditative, this was going to be a shock for them. So I said, yeah, maybe I ought to come. So I go in. I've been a Catholic my whole life. And, you know, for the first many years, the priest said, it's back to you. Spoken Latin, the idea was to get out in 20 minutes, and you go in, and I thought this was like something I had never experienced in my life except on Broadway. You know, there was incredible music, there were liturgical dancers, these 250 pound men, it looked like they could play linebackers for the Ravens doing spins and splits. It was incredible, and then the sermon, where the word was really taken seriously, deconstructed, and just elegantly done. And I was totally taken. I can't sing, I was singing, I was swaying, everything was great. And then all of a sudden I hear, and Professor Reardon is here with the students from the University of Illinois, and he's going to explain what, uh, where his home church is and uh, what, what his uh, ministry is here this morning. And I'm like, oh my God, 800 African American folks who I just met who watched me be incompetent a whole lot of ways already. And so I got up and I, I thought, you know, should you just lie and claim a home church? You know, in the Catholic Church, you just go to confession, you can wash away. But in the Baptist, I don't know, you have to lie. So I, I told the truth. I wasn't really fully churched up at that moment. They all applauded. That scene, that was flawed. It was good. And, uh, <laughs> then I said, uh, we're from the University of Illinois. We're your state university. We have a land-grant mission to try to bring to communities and to raise up in communities knowledge and skills and resources that can help address the concerns that you have. And we're doing a planning process in this neighborhood. You might have seen the daycare facility we worked on, the cleanup, and some of the park activity. We're now doing the next phase, and we can't imagine going forward without your input. Standing ovation, 20 people thanked me, hugged me, kissed me. I had lipstick all over. As they call it giving you sugar, letting me lay some sugar on you. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. But that act was extraordinary. Years later, we did a 10-year evaluation of the project. And somebody asked this morning, how did you decide to trust this guy, Jonathan London, from UC Davis? And one of the first things that folks said at the 10-year evaluation was, um, you came to our church. And you came to our church every three months. It was such a powerful connection. And we started getting by and people started to come that we came back to report what had happened. And after a while, we didn't have to do the report. Folks from their congregation who were involved would come back and do the report. And they said it was so unlike the politicians who would come only on election, do a quick thing and say, I'd love to spend time with you to hear what you're doing, but I have to go to a really big, important church now to do my rap. And they said that that really uh, mattered. The second thing they said, the tenure evaluation, was that they had heard the story of this little girl telling me I was full of hooey. After all the design work we had done, we had to throw it all out and start over again. And the fact that you listened with great humility and actually changed what you were doing based upon uh, local knowledge and the fact that you made a long-term commitment. So we did these projects. We did these, we called them uh, scrape-up projects, the home small home repairs. The state found out what we were doing. They then started giving us allocation of home funds to do modern rehab. We started doing that work. We would then do all the paperwork. Local black contractors would get the jobs, and we would do the finished work. So if we got 50000 and you could do maybe three homes. We could stretch it to four by having university students do the painting and the staining and the demolition and all the unskilled stuff. And the local black uh, contractors who never had a chance to get into that market were able to do that. So we did that, and it was going along pretty well. And then a person came up and said, you know, we got all these nice houses now, but there are all these missing houses from the out-migration. We'd like to build new. Well, we knew the incomes were so low. So Habitat for Humanity came to us and said, We'd like to help you start building some houses in the neighborhood. We explained that Habitat at that point took no grants. You know, you pay for everything. What they did to get the prices down was to squeeze out the labor costs, right? By doing all volunteer work. But our people, even with that reduction, couldn't pay for these houses. We couldn't keep them going. We needed to do something with grants on top of the labor for the materials, etc. And the Habitat director, I loved it, had his hat on, and you know, the Jimmy Carter hat. And he flipped it over and said, well, how about if we formed a new organization? I said, well, don't you want one? He says, well, we'll call this the East St. Louis Faith-Based Housing Initiative. 
and we'll take subsidies, we'll use the same infrastructure that we have for Habitat, and we'll accommodate the lower income needs. And we started building some new houses. And that was really extraordinary. The residents would identify which family was in the greatest need. They would mobilize volunteer hours so that that family, regardless of how much stress they were under, could meet the local uh, contribution requirements of Habitat. And our students, architecture and planning and landscape students, sitting down with a family and doing a design on, a, on a, a board, right? And then three months later, they do the opening. They ask those students to give the keys to the family and then to go in and see a house that was just a sketch that didn't have the love and attention and sense of history and more memorialization of the families and what they've accomplished. To see a family turn a structure into a home, our students would just weep to realize that they had a small hand. Now, I could go on, as you can imagine, but uh, <laughs> since we don't have that much time, let me just give you the, the final chapter on this and then some quick reflections. Um, the, we did the infill houses, and then one morning, it was on my birthday, September 15th, please write me, uh, <laughs> K. Reared me, uh, Memphis you. My mother always would call me at 534, which is when I apparently hit the deck at Misericordia <laughs> Hospital um, in the Bronx. And so this morning, I'm in bed with my wife, uh, now 30 years, and the phone rings at 458. My mother was a bookkeeper, and I thought, oh, a little odd. So my wife, read it, your mother, here. So I got on the phone, it's not my mother, it's some crazy lady from East St. Louis. They're gonna build a light rail line from St. Louis International Airport down to the casino districts on the waterfront. All we have to do is get them to extend it 13 miles into East St. Louis <laughs> through the poor census tracts where you're already working, right? And then we'll have access to living wage jobs back at the airport and with those living wage jobs, we'll be able to have the income to build out the rest of our neighborhood. I'm saying, this is fantastic. Who the hell is this? <laughs> we'll see all the dates. So we organized <coughs> a project called the 1001 Reasons Why the Regional Transportation Project is um, ill-conceived. We'll use those polite <laughs> words. <laughs> and we organized students in archaeology because we have all these wonderful Native American sites and African American historical sites that had never been properly uh, identified and interpreted that could be a part of an argument for why there'd be sites and uh, locations to get reasons to get off the train if we could get it to be extended. We got the economic department to lay out all the reasons why you could make a light rail system be less of a money loser by having two-way traffic. You take people in from the airport in St. Louis into the downtown, but then you can get folks from East St. Louis and take them back out to the airport, where otherwise the trains would be empty until the end of the day and vice versa. So the St. Louis Metrolink has become one of the best producing, it still loses a lot of money, but for a low density urban system it's done very well because of Seattle Davis. All we had to do is get the Federal Transportation Agency, two state legislatures, about 14 municipalities, <laughs> to decide to spend whatever 13 miles worth of light rail costs. I think it's a huge number. And these folks, they said, let us worry about the organizing. You worry about the arguments and support of the extension. So we did this project. And one evening in East St. Louis, Miss Davis organized a community meeting in this Leslie Bates Davis neighborhood house, Jim. She got 500 of her best friends to come. It was packed. In the middle was a little circle, and uh, in the circle where there were uh, three chairs, the mayor of St. Louis's chair, the mayor of East St. Louis's chair, and the head of the Regional Council of Governments chair. And when I went over to look at them, and she had the local community college come with their video, vid vid videographers, and they had these big uh, art lamps, these cleat lamps, what do we call them? And so these seats were already like 120 degrees. Uh, and I'm thinking, this is interesting. And the seats were also all wobbly. One leg on each seat was shorter than the other. So I said to Ciola, I said, you know, you got to change out those seats. She laughed. She said, it took us an hour to find them. <laughs> she says, these are professional politicians. These, are, these guys know how to tap dance in front of any audience. We're community folks. We rarely get a chance to get up in the comments and make our case. We need whatever edge we can get. 
So those seats were scientifically chosen. <laughs> They're ergonomically incorrect <laughs> to the maximum. Taking on our, our Asian American women colleague doing that great project with immigrant workers and the seamstress uh, industry. So the room filled up, our students got loaded with all the departments one after another ready to deliver like an hour and a half research report. These poor guys are sitting there and the mayor of East St. Louis is a guy named uh, Gordon something, I'm blanking on his name. Um, age. So uh, he was follically, he was uh, follically challenged, bald man. And of course the cleat lamp is on top of him, so he's sweating and then he's blistering. So we only got up to C, city planning arguments. We never got to engineering and landscape and all the other reasons why our plan was superior to the regional plan. And finally he got up and says, I think I know where this train is going. Do you have a route? And we had little kids from the neighborhood, we went over to the wall, we pulled the string, and we called it the laser line. And the laser line was going to go through all of the poor census tracts in East St. Louis, where we had quietly assisted community-based organizations to acquire the land around the proposed stations. So it was speculation for social justice. We were doing the planning and we were advising people in the neighborhood who, if we were successful, to buy the land because that meant that any development near the train station so close to downtown St. Louis highly desirable, and if they own the land, they would be at the negotiating table, led by Stilla Davis. And if she was going to be on that side of the table, I knew things would turn out okay. And so the mayor gets up and says, uh, I'm for it. And they said, well, we'd like you to sign something. So he goes over to sign the map, and he signs the map, and then Stilla Davis signed three separate copies of an agreement that he would support this. And so now today, you have a 13-mile extension through East St. Louis, and it allowed for the development of neighborhoods that would have never occurred, and that was not a proposal from well-trained uh, uh, planners from the University of Illinois. It was from grassroots leaders who were active in the local political party system with all of its flaws, who got an early warning and knew that this made economic sense, environmental sense, that it would promote a more just pattern of regional development. As soon as that happened, a miracle occurred like the dead arising, uh, you know, Lazarus coming out of the tomb, right? It's Lent, so I'm into you know, a couple of little badly uh, referenced uh, religious uh, notes. Uh, all of a sudden, developers started coming across the bridge from St. Louis to East St. Louis, because now we have the most desirable, already publicly assembled land, albeit under the control of Teola Davis. And we wanted one developer, Richard McC uh, Barron, Baron McCormick Salazar, the best builder I think of affordable housing, but he had never worked in East St. Louis because it was a political mess. So University, St. Louis University was setting up an urban planning and landscape architecture program. He was funding the whole thing. I got invited to be the keynote speaker at it. They didn't know me well enough to think that and realize that would be a bad idea. And my whole presentation was the seduction of Richard Barron. Why we just couldn't have any developer. We needed an inspired developer. We didn't need any developer. We needed a developer who would create living wage jobs. We didn't need, and I went on and on and on. It was embarrassing. We showed every slide that we showed great examples of what we wanted our project to look like was one of Richard's buildings. <laughs> Everybody in the room realized, so I'm leaving, and I go outside, you know, not knowing Mike Andreasich from architecture and I, we did the pitch together. And we go outside and this big arm on my shoulder and a door opens and he pulls me into the mop closet, the janitor's <laughs> closet, says, okay, you got me. And as a result of that, McCormick Baron Salazar made a commitment to do a mixed income housing project in the middle of that neighborhood, which is stunning. It has a, a full city block park with an Olympic swimming pool in it. It's named after Ciola Davis. On one end of the park is a Montessori school with 80 uh, slots. On the other end of the park is a middle high school, a charter school, the Fannie Lou Hamer Youth Empowerment School. It has one of the highest uh, test scores in the metro region. Why? Because all the classwork at that school is connected to the adults' ongoing community development activities in the neighborhood. So you don't want to come to school on Monday, because you told me you were a little school challenged. But on Monday, we're doing uh, a ramp for a Gulf War veteran. And you know that man, and you care about him, you're going to go and learn all the mathematics, do all the geometry, learn all the calculations necessary related to math to figure out the materials, do the buying, et cetera, et cetera. On Wednesday, you still don't want to come to school, but on Wednesday, we're doing a raised bed herb garden for the Senior Citizen Center. 
and you're, you're raised by your grandparents and your, aunt, your aunties. So you're going to be there. So they got an incredible attendance. And the last thing I would say about the project, and then just one minute of reflection about its impact, is that uh, it also began to change the perception that elites in the city and the region had of young kids of color. Because every time they turned around, they saw these Fannie Lou Hamer varsity jackets out building incredible things. So I knew that we had really made a change when one day I was out supervising some kids doing a landscaping project from the high school, and a federal judge stopped by on his way home, and he asked the kids what they were doing. He was a gardener, so he was totally captured by what they were doing. Said, you need more materials. I'll come by tomorrow when I'm when my day off Saturday, and just tell me what kinds of things you need. What's your uh, plant palette, et cetera. The next day he came by with a wad of business cards, and he said to the kids, if you need summer jobs, I will hook you up. Now this would have never happened. There was a complete city trench separating the lives of a federal judge in East St. Louis, completely surrounded in a gated community to the max, and these young people. The last thing I would say is um, about this is the impact that it had on our students was in many cases life transforming. And I've just finished, finally, the book on this project. It's called Wading in the Water, the Emergence of Empowerment Planning in East St. Louis. And it's dedicated to these eight women and to the leadership of Ciola Davis, who was the prophetic voice that made this happen and continues to make incredible and possible things happen in that city. But the young people who got to see these women take on such incredibly difficult issues with so little support, and then to see that your technical training, if humbly offered under a resident-led process, could in fact have a, a transformative impact, has stayed with these kids. So two years ago, I went down to the Gulf. We did some work in the Lower Ninth Ward on the recovery plan with Acorn before uh, they got canonized. Uh, and I'm looking at one of my former students. She's the head of all Enterprise Foundation housing projects, the whole Gulf, $300,000, Michelle. Wetton. I look up and I see a picture of Ciola Davis at a ribbon cutting. It's brand new. And I said, Michelle, I'm really interested in this picture. She starts to smile. She says, well, they were doing the senior housing project, assisted living, and they were $4 million short. She graduated from the University of Illinois 15 years ago, but two years ago she found $4 million from a socially responsible investment fund to make that project happen. The current chief counsel for HUD, Damon uh, Smith, his grandfather was a Tuskegee Airman, his father head of uh, Affirmative Action at Ohio University. He claims that he comes from the uh, Ciola Davis School of Planning, and he is the senior advisor to, Dave, to, uh, to Sean uh, Donovan. We're currently in the process at the University of Memphis of fighting our local housing authority to keep the last 420 units of public housing in the city. And we're not getting much help from our city officials. I was able to call Brother Smith and within an hour, the mayor, who had to return my phone call for three months, called me up to say that he'd love to meet with me on Monday. <laughs> uh, the most recent commissioner of housing for the city of New York, Rafael Sestero, graduate of the East St. Louis School of Planning at Ciola Davis. And my last example would be uh, Juan Salgado, who runs the, one of the co-directors of the Resurrection Project, was one of the key leaders in the immigration reform movement in the latter years of the Bush administration, was invited to give the joint uh, presentation before the Senate and House for the Republic of Mexico about the grassroots effort to push immigration rights and reform in a positive direction, he was graduate of the East St. Louis School of Planning. So it not only, I think, supported an amazing resident-led effort that made significant improvements in that community, but it also changed the professional imagination and commitments and career trajectories. It did great things for the universities design programs which started attracting people from all over the country who would never imagine going to Champaign-Urbana to do urban anything, because we don't have an urban, right? Uh, all of a sudden it became the place to go because you could do interdisciplinary, community, problem-solving, research, et cetera. And then the last thing is that the East St. Louis model of empowerment planning has developed quite a lot of national and international uh, traction. It was the best practice by HUD, it was the best practice at Habitat II, and currently, I'm working with a group of um, trade union leaders in the Cimento River Valley in, in uh, Sicily, in a, a, a new town that was built in the 1970s that now needs to be redeveloped. And they went on the web, and then they consulted with uh, Habitat 2. They said, we're poor. Uh, 
but we have lots of practical knowledge and we have a university nearby. Is there a model that we could draw from? And so now we are consulting. 20 years later with the University of Catania and their work in the Cemento River Valley. So it also has some international uh, gravitas and is a very developed theoretical model, which I won't go into, but it combines participatory action research, direct action organizing, and the popular education work of Bell Hooks, Miles Horton, and uh, Paolo Freire and Danilo Dulce. Thank you. Ken, that was uh, be, be beyond uh, beyond amazing, and, and ending it with the with the, the pantheon of, of gods of, of uh, bell hooks and Paolo Freire and Miles Horton and other just uh, c cemented you in, in that uh, in that uh, pantheon too. So uh, maybe that's building you up a little bit, but I, I think you deserve that, and um, thank you so much. Come back.